Right? Yeah. That's the fall of God's country for the world. Yeah. But the railroad didn't come in. I, I inquired of Roman, my brother-in-law. His dad is one of the first settlers. He says, hey, My father-in-law used to be in going down the Gulf once in a while from Helps. Uh, his name was Robinson Warren. Warren? <laughs> oh, yes, well, I just know him, yeah. 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 Well, hello there again. We're back with our second half of our bicentennial extravaganza. We have Mr. Holger Peterson on my right side. And we have Mr. Reynolds Salberg on the left. And we have quite an interesting time again this evening. This is being filmed in two parts, and a bit later, Charlie Lee will be joining us too. But gentlemen, let me just say I'm real happy to have you here. You fellows uh, have a wealth of information, and I'm sure you're modest about that, but as the, the questions and sessions unfold here, uh, it's intended for the use not only of our boys and girls in our school here, but anyone from the community who would like to view the film will be able to call for an appointment and the librarian would be happy to set it up and they can sit in a comfortable room and, and view it. And so it'll become a lasting thing. It'll become property of uh, North Dickinson County School and we hope it'll be around for many years. So, Mr. Peterson, it's real good to have you with us. Thank and, you very much, Mr. Wilmer. And I'd just like to ask you uh, a question or two, and then I'm going to uh, have Mr. Solberg talk for a bit, and then we will just pass the microphone back and forth and uh, see what we can do here in the line of uh, finding out more about our school system. First of all, Mr. Peterson, you're from the Foster City area, and that is quite a prominent name around Foster City. Could you tell us just a, a bit about the name of the Peterson family? Well, my dad <clears throat> arrived from Sweden the year of 1890 and settled there at Foster City, first at Hardwood, actually, and then over at Foster City. Mm -hmm. He... Uh, got into the logging business quite early. Did he find that a uh, hard uh, thing to get into, logging, or, or was it something that he had done in the old country? No. Now, what, what age was he uh, when he first came? He was 20. Oh. And he hadn't done any logging in Sweden, but he got interested when he got over here. Mm -hmm. And there was a mill, of course, at Hardwood and one at Foster City. Hmm where he worked for a while, and then he started on his own and started logging. I see. Did uh, When he got started on his own, then uh, was he a jobber? He was a jobber. With uh, fellows working for him? Right. Mm -hmm. He built a camp, logging camp, and hmm. hired some people and started logging. <laughs> and uh, I would like to ask this question, since so many... Swedish people did come to this country. Is there one thing about this part of the United States that lured these people here from the Scandinavian countries? It's my opinion that it is. It's a similar area to the old country. Mm -hmm. And we had a lot of uh, Swedish and Finnish people that settled around Foster City and Hardwood. Mm -hmm. Well, were there other uh, were there other nationalities that came in as well, or did it was it mainly uh, the Swedish? There were there were a number of English and Irish and French people. That was the main, along with the Scandinavians. Mm hmm I see. Well, we have the name Charlevoix. Steve uh, Charlevoix is going to be with us, gentlemen, at some time too. Uh, his wife is uh, in a Green Bay hospital at this time, so he couldn't be with us tonight as he had planned earlier. But uh, we hope to hear something then about the French people too. Yes, there was a considerable number of French people came in, especially around the Hardwood area. I see. 
Okay, I'm going to be asking you a couple of more questions. Uh, <coughs> one of the things I, of course, am interested in was was in school, and did they talk Swedish and that sort of thing. So we're going to take that up in just a minute. I'd find it a little bit tough uh, if I had to converse with uh, children coming to school today that uh, spoke only Swedish. Well, Mr. Solberg, it's good having you with us as well <laughs> yeah. this evening, and uh, you're from the Felch area. And, All right. Uh, uh, maybe you have some opening things that you'd like to, to say about, about your family when you first uh, came to Felch, or maybe you were even born in Felch. No. I yeah, I was, uh, I was born and raised in Felch. My dad, uh, I think he came to that area around 1890. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was in 1893 that he bought the farm and the uh, home that most of us were born and raised in. And he purchased this home from... Uh, a doctor by the name of Dr. Gaffson, one of the first uh, doctors that they had in that oh, Well, he was a area. medical doctor? Yeah, a medical doctor, well, yeah. Well, that's interesting because yeah. we don't even have a medical doctor in this part of the county today. Yeah, and uh, that home that we lived in, all the material for that home was hauled uh, from across country from Norway. There were no sawmills or anything like that. There were a few... Uh, cabins that were built out of logs, you know, mm -hmm. uh, but the uh, homes, uh, lumber homes, uh, all the lumber had to be hauled across from Norway. Well, did they have, uh, did they have a planing mill, or was that lumber in those days, uh, rough lumber? Uh, no, it was, uh, they had planing mills in those days, mm -hmm. too, yeah. Fine. Of course, like the, uh, the bigger uh, parts of the lumber, like two by sixes and two by fours, that was mostly all rough lumber. I see. But uh, finishing it was all plain, good lumber, yeah. Well, you know, one thing that uh, I've been teaching out in this area for, <coughs> oh, let's see, five years in this building, the last five years the Foster City building stood, and four or five years in Felch when I first came to the area, and I'm from Randville myself, but uh, over the years I've noticed this, that... Uh, here you have all these little settlements right along, <laughs> yeah. and each place by George has got its own place name. And uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's one well, thing I want cleared up tonight, if we can well, do that. That's well, a mystery to me. I think uh, that was uh, on account of the schools that they had built. Now, the first school they ever had in that area was at Metropolitan. Ring that uh, I've been teaching out in this area for, <coughs> oh, let's see, five years in this building, the last five years the Foster City building stood, and four or five years in Felch when I first came to the area, and I'm from Randville myself, but uh, over the years I've noticed this, that uh, here you have all these little settlements right along, <laughs> yeah. and each place by George has got its own place name. And uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's one well, thing I want cleared up tonight, if we can well, do that. Well, a mystery to me. I think uh, that was uh, on account of the schools that they had built. Now, the first school they ever had in that area was at Metropolitan. And uh, when that school closed down, they had another school at Felch. And that building that was a schoolhouse is now... Uh, right next to the Texaco gas station that was converted into a home. A fellow by the name of Carl Lund lived there for a good many years. And then he sold out to uh, Sandry's that had that Texaco station. They moved the home and... I see. And, uh, but there was, uh, <laughs> there was schools that uh, later on, there was a bigger school built at Felch and one in Metropolitan. And then uh, as time went on, they had a school in what they called a Princeton location. Yes. That's about uh, four or five miles uh, west of Felch. And they had one at the Graceville location that you can still see if you drive along 69, the foundation. Right. Just by before you get to the mine road, right? Everybody knows <laughs> by the pink rod, right? <laughs> right. Yeah, right. 
And then they had one uh, up, what would you call the clearing, north of Felch. Let's see, were there any more? No, I think that was all. Oh, yeah, no, by the way, they had a school up at what they call the Lehman location on the Lehman Road between Norway Lake and Segola. Yes. There was a school there, and they had one at Norway Lake at one time. Oh. Just a small building, and uh, when they started uh, taking the kids to the beaver schools, Sundstrom bought that building and it's still in the yard <laughs> there oh, wow. at his old home. <laughs> <laughs> what school was it that he bought? Uh, what they call an RLA school. It was just a small well, building, yeah. but they right. had uh, yeah. maybe Thank seven, you. eight kids there, yeah. Hmm. And Miss Viola Dixon was a teacher up there that time. She, she has passed away quite a few years ago. Well, would yeah. she be mother to uh, several of Dixon's? Uh, no, as, uh, no. Not. She uh, she died uh, when she was quite young. Yeah. I see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's see, you know, the other <laughs> school, yeah. Well, then when the consolidation came, naturally all the kids were brought to Felch, the big school. I see. And in 1936, uh, through WPA projects, and that's when the addition was put on to the old school at Felch. I see, about yeah. 40 years ago, then, the old Felch uh, school 40 was, years uh, ago, right. Just about doubled, or was it doubled? Or? Oh, yes, yes, it doubled the capacity. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> okay, we'll uh, we'll get back to uh, the mining situation in, in just a couple of uh, minutes with you, and uh, I know that uh, there are mine shafts around Felch, and uh, we'd like to pursue that for a minute or, t a minute or two. And then, Mr. <coughs> Peterson, coming back, yes, coming back to... Uh, these students, if they, if a big share of the parents came from uh, Sweden or the Scandinavian countries, were they able to speak English at all when they uh, came into the school? Some did, but a lot of them didn't. A lot of them didn't know English, and that must have been a task to, you know, to, for the teacher. Well, did they did they try to hire a teacher who was fluent in speaking Swedish or no? No, they didn't. <laughs> the kids just had to learn, that's all. But we had uh, six schools in Breen Township at one time. Six of them? Sure, one at Alford and one at Shepherdsville, they called it. And then, of course, there was a one-room school at Foster City, one at Hardwood, and one at Hylas. One at Calumet Mine location, that's south of Felshire. That was oh. built in 1906. Oh. But... Uh, <laughs> The one-room school in Foster City was on the hill, and that uh, was much too small in the just around the 1900 period. So they renovated the town hall. They had a town hall there and made two rooms there. And then the Longfellow School was built in 1909 and, oh, yeah. and that's started the one in, I was in. That's the one you were in. Yeah. yeah. 1910. Huh. And then they built new schools, replacing the one-room schools at Hardwood and also at Hylas. Hmm. And then a little bit later on, there was one in what we call the Fintown area of Foster City, a little one-room school. Yeah, and that was called Fintown because, was, that, was it because there were the Finnish people set, settled in? About 100% of them up there in that <laughs> area were, were, <laughs> you were Finnish. Get, you can't get any higher percentage of that again. And they all started, you know, they all had farms and a few cows, and then they worked at the mill. Sure, at the sawmill. So... Well, then I would like to ask this, following up on this uh, school situation, the children then spoke Swedish and the teacher didn't necessarily speak, at least she didn't speak fluent Swedish. And the textbooks, of course, then would have been in, in English mm. rather than uh, Swedish. Right. How did um, they do in school? D uh, did they do what you would think of as... Uh, comparison uh, comparable today did they do quite well as compared to today or did they have a real problem I think they done real well it didn't take the kids long to learn English and I think they got onto that the first year they were in school there maybe halfway through and hmm. I'm sure they done real well well then uh, following through this grade school uh, how how many years would they have gone to school?
compared to today, or did they have a real problem? I think they done real well. It didn't take the kids long to learn English, and I think they got onto that the first year they were in school there, maybe halfway through, and hmm. I'm sure they done real well. Well, then, uh, following through the grade school, uh, how how many years would they have gone to school? Like, um, did they ha they did they have a kindergarten? Yes, they did. Okay, they had a kindergarten, and then they they uh, went to what sixth grade, eighth grade, or eight, eight grades. And at Foster City, they started uh, two more grades, high school, in uh, I think 1914. So they had ten grades at Foster City. I see. But mm -hmm. none of the other schools had uh, any high school classes. I see. Mm -hmm. uh, I suppose perhaps it was a rarity if someone went to college in those days. Is that true or not true? Maybe there, maybe there were several who went. I don't know. Well, I am not sure in the early days, but uh, I'd say from about 1915 and on, there were some that went to college. And when uh, quite a number went to Northern, there was a normal. They called it the Northern the normal. State Normal at that yes. time. And I was just wondering then a, a follow-up question on that. If they went through the 10th grade, uh, would they have any trouble getting into the colleges in those days? They had to complete their high school either at Iron Mountain, Escanaba, or I Norway, or some other place. First. Yeah. I see. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, townships then paid the tuition if they did go oh. on to high school. Fine. Good deal. What... Uh, type of work they went into, I suppose, was mainly logging, uh, the, working at the mills, perhaps some farming, what sort of uh, things they moved into. I'd like to follow up with you in just, just a couple of minutes. Fine. Maybe we can, uh, we'll pick up what their employment once they got out of school. And right now, Mr. Salberg, uh, if we could get back to this mining situation, and uh, you could name some of them. Well, first of all, what was the mining company. Was there one main company or was there more than My one that was golly, I, I don't remember the names of the mining company, but uh, that mine that was at Felch Mountain, that we call Felch Mountain okay, now, right. that was called a Northwestern Mine. Mm -hmm. And I think that operated till uh, in either 1907 or 1908 when they had a flood in the mine and I think there are still some bodies down in that mine, so they closed it completely. Is that uh, right? Yeah. The one up on a hill that would up be just uh, north of the highway? Uh, there's well, there's no uh, no remains of the mine yet, but there is a shaft there, and that's covered. And that's right at, uh, as you go up the, over the hill, uh, past our school, and then up over the hill. Yes. Going north, or it's just off and to the left. The right. mine, that's where the mine was, although there were open pit mining for the east. Mm -hmm. And then there was a uh, Calumet mine. That's about two and a half or three miles south of uh, Felch. Yes. And that operated till 1909. And then they closed down completely. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Well, uh, what about the ore? Did they haul it out? Did the railroad then come along and they uh, yeah, shipped they were, the ore on the rail yeah, to Escanaba? Yeah, there was That's right, yeah. There was, uh, the railroads were in, and most of the ore was hauled to Escanaba. Well, all the ore was hauled to Escanaba by rail. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, I understood that the ore had such a high sulfur content that they they just quit mining it. Huh? Of course, uh, they discovered the uh, ore bodies uh, with a lot of maybe a better percentage of iron and so on and so forth in other parts, you know. So well, on. where was uh, down in the Calumet mine area? Were there a lot of houses that sprung up, or not so many, oh. or just? Uh, oh yeah, there were quite a number of houses. Yeah, it's a Calumet mine at one time. Yeah, yeah. Has uh, when you drive down that way now, there's uh, there is what a couple of houses. Uh, there's also. a couple of the old houses mm -hmm. uh, that were from the mining location yeah. at that time. Yeah. Does the mining yeah. company still own land down in there? Well, most of the land that the mining company is, uh, the Kimberly uh, Clark uh, company owns that. Uh, oh, I see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Well, how did... Here's, here's got to be a natural question. How did the miners and the lumberjacks get along? Well, the mining was the first uh, in this area before lumbering. Oh. So they kind of owned the place, or... Well, did they get along uh, pretty well, or...? Oh, I guess so, of course. They had their little yeah, differences, you know, and they have a few fights once in a while, but that... Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, were they kind of clickish? In other words, did they kind of stay together? Well, or in a way, the yeah. Done, you had these up? certain ethnic groups there. You had the Frenchmen, they kind of stuck together. And then you had, uh, there was quite a few French in this area at that time, too, you I know, see. mining and logging. Then you had the Finnish. They really stuck together because they had to, boy, because, <laughs> <laughs> you know... Pure friend was a bad name at that time, you know. Is that right? My yeah. golly, do you think that you were a pure friend, boy? You were, you were all ready to come with a knife and really raise Cain, but <laughs> <laughs> actually that wasn't the case at all. Now these were they were real good people, mm -hmm. but they uh, they had to stick together, you know. Most of the Scandinavian or the Swedes and the Norwegian they got along pretty good, didn't they? Well, That's in my recollection now. Yeah. What happened before well, you know, my time? I wouldn't know. Uh, <laughs> you're going back over the years to that time, and now here we are, right uh, in this bicentennial year, and uh, oh, people talking about uh, ethnic groups and so forth. It's still a big thing. Now the U.S. Mm -hmm. has always been. When I was a boy in school, was always called the melting pot of the nations, right, and now yeah. it <laughs> no. seems like there's forces trying to unmelt it and segregate that, it into little chunks. That's quite true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, did the children? Uh, that's where you could tell it. The, how would the children get along? Well, the children got along real good. Didn't they went to school. Yes, yeah. we've had. Uh, kids coming to our school when I was a youngster, they couldn't even talk English. And in fact, they were born in this area right here. Yes. But their folks only well, spoke Swedish and Finnish at home, so what do you expect the kids? <laughs> but it didn't take long, a year or so, and they could... In fact, I recall uh, there was a number that came from the old country with their folks, you know. I see. Sure. When I, I was going to so. school and some from Finland and some from Sweden, and by golly, they it didn't take long before they could talk just as good English as the rest of us. <laughs> and I'll tell you, a lot better English that they're talking right now. <laughs> well, yeah, yes. well, I teach English, and uh, I, I, yeah. I know that I've always said this, fellas. When I can get the playground English to jibe with what they tell me in the classroom, well, then I'll feel yeah. I've been a success, but until then, it's an uphill battle. Because <laughs> well, they can walk right out of my class and go out well, on the playground, and you wonder if they've been to school that day. Yeah, well, years ago, we had some pretty tough teachers. and You either learned or else. It was no <laughs> one way or the other. Now, we had one, uh, maybe you heard of old Mr. Bond that taught yes. school here for a yes. good many years. Yes. I remember he was a stickler for English, reading, and writing. If you couldn't write your name, <laughs> it didn't take him long before you'd either learn to write or else. <laughs> well, E.M. Uh, Blunquist uh, used to yeah, fill, and us, used to fill, him fill us in on that, and, <laughs> and so he had some fond recollections of, uh, of the fellow, Mr. Vaughn. Well, uh, Mr. Peterson, then, uh, we were going to discuss here for a minute the type of work that the people kind of naturally gravitated into if they... Uh, stayed in the area. First off, all I have to ask, did most of the people stay in the area? I know most of them would probably like to, but did the, the most of them stay? Well, Young people growing up, that is. Yes, quite a, most of them did stay and went into the mill or into the logging camps. Uh -huh. Well, then they, of course, being the second generation families, uh, you, we might call them, I suppose that America was really by that time home sweet home and their children spoke, spoke English while observing some of the Swedish customs or French customs or what have you. Sure, most, uh, most of the second generation stayed around. I mean, they went either to the woods or to the mill. Some started uh, small farms 
And that lasted pretty well up until World War I. Mm -hmm. After that, of course, then Ford Motor Company came into Iron Mountain and the big majority of our people went to work over there and left our area. I see. Then you noticed quite a population <laughs> change it after was a the war. Tremendous then. after World War I. Mm -hmm. And some of the younger fellows went down to Detroit and other cities. Yeah, that was that was another thing. Our mill sawmill closed in 1924, and of course then there was very little to do. Was that sawmill? Was that a was that a Peterson? Uh, no, that was uh, it was A. M. Harmon Lumber Company, first, run by. A.L. Foster, and that's where Foster City got their oh, got its name. Well, I, of course, I was going to ask that question before the evening was over here. A.L. Foster. Alonzo Foster from Cleveland. He was uh, yeah. manager for the A.M. Harmon Lumber Company, and he operated that with Price for a number of years, and then the Morgan Company of Oshkosh, Wisconsin, put some money into the business, and one of the Morgans got to be secretary. And in 1902, <coughs> the name was changed to the Morgan Lumber and Cedar Company, a subsidiary of Morgan Company of Oshkosh. Hmm. They were big sash and door people down oh, in Oshkosh. Wow. And of course, the lumber, all the lumber that they needed down there was cut up here at Foster City and sent down there. Mm -hmm. And they had a shingle mill, lath mill, planing mill, Tremendous demand for cedar in those early days, shingles and posts and poles and... Well, was that, uh, was that possibly because what we call the roll roofing wasn't as popular or it didn't come along yet or... I didn't see any rolled roofing in those okay, days well, at all. Well, that would explain the cedar, uh, cedar shakes then, okay. <coughs> so then that would call for quite, a, quite an amount of it. Tremendous amount. I know the Morgan Company, they had tremendous piles of cedar and cut it up into shingles and... Well, uh, then I, I would like to, to uh, go back for just a moment and say this. When I was in the second grade in Segola, I came with my parents over to Foster City. Uh, I believe it was just before school started. They had an auction sale and they sold off many buildings there in Foster City. My grandfather bought the old blacksmith shop or one of the buildings. I thought it was a blacksmith shop. I don't recall for sure. But he, of course, tore it down for the lumber to, to build a barn with over on the PV Falls Road. So I remember that day quite well that it was a big, uh, a big activity. And Would then, that be about 1943? Yes. Yes, I believe that probably was the year. That's the year they had the auction on several of the buildings. The old store building, the town hall, one barn, the blacksmith shop, and two, three other sheds. They were all sold off. Mm -hmm. Well, I met a boy over there for the first time, and his name was Lowell Peterson. <laughs> and later on... <laughs> uh, when I uh, Lowell started uh, coming to school in Segola, when his mother started teaching over there, right. Alma Peterson, right, and so Lowell and I got to be great friends. And uh, of course, I've only seen Lowell about twice since we've been out of high school. Well, he's way down Augusta, Georgia. Is that right? Right. A well, good deal. And that's your nephew then. Right. Well, fine. You were you you and Harry then are brothers. Brothers. Oh, quite interesting. Now, now we'll switch over here, and I've got to find out a couple more questions. Mr. Salberg, uh, this baseball team, switching to sports, the Felch Rangers are yeah. really going great guns, and uh, I don't know for how long they've gone great guns, but since I've been teaching over here about, what did I say, 14 or 15 years, uh, the Felch Rangers have always been a big name, and uh, I know that your 
vitally interested with that team oh, over there. And, yeah. <laughs> and so I'd like you to tell us a little bit about it. Uh, what, what, a, what a little bit about the team history, maybe. In well, I can tell you, baseball in this area here in Felt, that they had teams here as long as I can remember. Oh, there were some years when they didn't have it, and you know what I mean. But uh, my brothers played baseball way back in the uh, late 1900s. Hmm. And, uh, and uh, you know, they had teams right around. Foster City used to have a ball team. Hardwood had a ball team. And, and then it kind of died out for a few years till uh, after the war, and World War II, rather. Mm -hmm. And then it picked up, and uh, there were ball teams, Iron Mountain, Kingsford, Crystal Falls, and they had uh, a real good league. But then as time went on, these bigger towns like Iron Mountain and Kingsford and Crystal Falls dropped out, but felt they still <laughs> kept it going, and they, uh, they'd have teams uh, from Wisconsin and some from Delta County and further south, Monona County. And they keep kept baseball alive. It's only one year in the last uh, since the war that we didn't have a baseball team in Felch. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So that goes back quite a ways then. It goes back a long, long ways. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And of course, uh, if they got that type of enthusiasm, I'm sure the record has been yeah. uh, commendable <laughs> and. Uh, Interesting. Well, years ago, you know, they played baseball wherever they had a little opening that uh, <laughs> I know they used to have a uh, field there. <laughs> when you're playing the outfield, boy, you want to watch out. You didn't step over <laughs> in a hole or uh, over a big angle. boulder or something. Yes. Sure. Now, uh, the field that they have now compared to what they played on years ago, well, there is no comparison. Yeah. But still, they love to play baseball, yeah. Yeah. And I suppose there was really some games that stood out in your mind as oh definitely so. yes right uh, right after the war when they had this league well Florence I recall Felch and Florence were playing off for the championship and uh, they were playing Florence had played at Felch the first game and they beat Felch three to two mm. second game they played at Florence. And my son, he was just 17 years old. He was just uh, going to high school yet. He comes up to, to bat with two men on, and he hits a home run over the right field fence. And I don't know yet to this day how he did it, because he didn't weigh over 115 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> and he won the game there. I think that's one of the greatest thrills I ever had in baseball. But of course, then, <laughs> well, of course then, you're, you're speaking partly as a father, too, there. Yeah. So uh, we yeah. can share that with you. That That's yeah. real... It's real great oh, to hear. That was a thrill for me, though. He was just a little... I know the, the Morgan Lumber and Cedar Company sponsored a baseball team back in 1910 for years. In fact, they imported some players from Menominee. They gave them jobs at the mill and brought oh. in, especially, you know, like a pitcher and well. maybe a couple other guys. But we got some old photos down home, a baseball team, 1913. Yeah. And, uh, oh, number of, you know. and they had pretty good teams, I I, I think, in those right. days. And I thought I thought them leagues back here, in the, all from 37 to through the 40s and early 50s were real. That was a real good league. Good teams, but an awful baseball field. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the fields, like Boston you say, they could City. turn an ankle in them. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know. Uh, Moving along here, and I know we're changing topics quite rapidly, but I'm trying to cover as many things as possible. Mr. Solberg, there in Felch uh, is the remains of probably a good-sized stable. What I'm referring to is there's a cement foundation that's quite lengthy, and it must have been a livery stable, and uh, if it was that... It certainly was sizable and could handle quite a few horses. Was that for the working teams, or do you know what I'm talking about there? Andrew Ryan was a big jobber. Uh, and, uh, of course, those days it was all by horses. By horses. And he must have had at least ten teams of horses. And he also had a pretty good-sized dairy herd, too. Oh. And he 
done a lot of farming. They had to raise his own potatoes and hay and grain and that for the horses. And that's the uh, foundation, you see, was his barn. Right there in, yeah. in the town. Right in the town, yeah. Well, then he probably bought a lot of lot of hay and... Oh, yes, stuff. he had to buy a lot of... When they got to the camps, he bought a lot of hay and grain and that for the team. So. Yeah, that's the only thing they had to hold logs with those days. Well, now, let's... In the uh, early 20s, you know, and on. Let me ask about a typical lumber camp. <coughs> um, they may say, sound romantic and so forth, but... Uh, when it comes to reality, now I'm, I'm going to make a statement, and then I want both you gentlemen to evaluate it because you see, I never saw one. But here's my my concept of it: you get away from the romance of it, and certainly, I'm sure as we read about it now, it was quite a glorious thing and so forth. But if the men uh, were sweaty and there wasn't bathing facilities, and if they came in and they hung their <laughs> their sweaty socks over the line and the ventilation wasn't too good, and they're mm -hmm. chewing tobacco and so forth, and uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I can sense that maybe you had to cut the air with a knife in order to get something to breathe and so forth. <laughs> and that's an awful uh, picture, but yeah, uh, yeah. speak about uh, something yeah, about well, the uh, I, I never, I never worked camp. in a lumber camp or in the... But what, in what you may have uh, heard of them and so but, forth. But, oh, yes, I uh, stayed overnight in some of those camps, oh, you know, you <laughs> yeah. Well, when uh, they'd come in at night, and clothing was usually wet, socks and that, and right above the stove they had some wires strung, and that's where they hung their socks and their mitts and that to dry out overnight. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah, which they and had there was no ventilation, and man, they kept everything pretty tight to close to keep warm. Yes, right. Yeah. And uh, the bunks that uh, they had was uh, built out of boards and... Uh, just straw for a mattress. There were no mattresses or anything like that to sleep on. Hmm. No, they were tough, <laughs> tough bunches. Oh, I'm sure jacket. probably <laughs> they didn't get sick very often. I imagine no. that they, they kept that pretty well worked off. Uh, what about the eats? I imagine they fed the oh, men. Oh, they, uh, they fed the men just as good as they They'd have to keep how, up yeah. that calorie content. Oh, my gosh, their, yes. Uh, the way they, the, you know, how hard they worked when they came in, they wanted something to eat, and they fed them good. Every lumber camp that I, in my recollection, uh, fed their men real good, yeah. Uh, uh, what about dinner time, the noon meal? Did they leave the woods and come back to uh, Cook Shack, or did they take well, a lunch with them, or how did if, that work? If they were close enough to camp, they came in for lunch. Otherwise, they... to eat, and they fed them good. Every lumber camp that I, in my recollection, uh, fed their men real good, yeah. Uh, uh, what about dinner time, the noon meal? Did they leave the woods and come back to uh, Cook Shack, or did they take well, a lunch with them, or how did if, that work? If they were close enough to camp, they came in for lunch. Otherwise, they brought the lunch out to them. The cook could pack, uh, what do they call it, a wanigan? That's what they call it. And uh, the chore boys would take, maybe he had a little sleigh there and that, and haul it out to the men. And the food was hot when it was brought out, you oh, know, and so plenty of it, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. What, was, what did you call that uh, lunch bu bucket? What was that, uh, Wanigan? Uh, well, I think that I think that name came from the log drives, uh, the shack that followed the log drives. But I know uh, in our case at home, uh, we... Most of the time, it was a little bit too far to come in for dinner, so it was hauled out with a little sled and big box that the cook packed all the <coughs> meal in and hauled out to the men at, in the woods. Mm -hmm. But they had, that was the name of the game, was eating there, because of the <laughs> tremendous feeds that they put on. I worked in my dad's camp in 1922, one winter, doing a chore boy. But we always, we never had too large a crew except up at Floodwood when my dad logged up at Floodwood up here. He had quite a few men then, but at home we only had maybe 15 or 16. But I was in several Morgan Company camps, and it wasn't too bad. What type of work uh, did, you, did you do then in those camps and around in that area? 
You mean the men? The uh, you purple. yourself. Oh, you I, I just done chores. Okay. Well, you one got winter. To... One winter. Took care of the barns and the cook camp, the wood, the water. Hauled out the noon meal. Kept the lanterns clean, lamps. Mm -hmm. Swept the floor, scrubbed once a week. Well, did the men get all the same price, or was uh, uh, no? Was it was that a differentiation there. A little bit. Teamsters got a little bit more. Maybe the sawyers usually was by the piece. Mm -hmm. So much a log, depending on the length. And I think the Teamsters were maybe five dollars a month more. Did they have to furnish their own horses, or did they have no, the company horses? The company, whoever they worked for, they furnished the horses. And I imagine they, uh, I imagine the company was <coughs> quite particular how their horses were taken care of. Well, they they had they were taken care of well. They they fed them a lot of grain and hay, and because that was hard work, they right. had to. For man and beast, they had to they had to eat in order just to to survive it. Right. Yeah. Well, I talked to the other men about. Uh, oh, uh, Mr. Haas was telling us about the railroads. That if a man got hurt working on the railroad in the Channing area, well, there was such a little remuneration for the fellow that he really found it a hardship when he no longer could work. So now I'd like to move kind of into the social conditions with you two fellows. If someone got hurt uh, working for the lumber company, uh, you mentioned Morgan's as being a, a, a big thing. Uh, I am assuming perhaps accidents were, were quite common. First of all, is that true or not? Uh, I don't know if they were quite common. I, I don't believe so. But there were accidents, of course. Bound to have been. But the Morgan Company in Foster City always, as long as I can remember, had a doctor. Oh. Mm. All the time that I recall, and I'm sure Dr. Mall was there for years and years, and then he left for Escanaba, and then they got another doctor. So as long as they run, they had a doctor, and uh, anybody had an accident, he was taken to there. And if it was real serious, they took him to Escanaba to the hospital. Oh, I see. What, what would be uh, the situation of a person could no longer work, such as age or accident? Was there uh, any type of pension plan in those days uh, connected with the... None that, I, none that I'm aware of. Just out of luck, uh, as far as that went. But then, uh, then that's when the, the, those days uh, the family was expected to take care of the family. Is that, that uh, that's exactly the case in those days? And I think they worked a little bit longer in those days. A lot of fellows worked till they were seventy or more. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. But well, uh, there was no uh, severance pay or anything like that in those days, or no unemployment compensation. Mm-hmm. Well, I think we've kind of lost something, uh, fellas, when we got away from the families taking care of the older family members. Uh, I know so often in education we hear about the Chinese people, how they, the older ones were actually put in a place of respectability, you know, and they are looked up to. And uh, I think we kind of forget and lose sight of the fact that that was quite often the case in this country too and I, I think we've kind of lost something when we got away from that nowadays we demand the government to do everything right. and then we right. wonder why the taxes are so high well you can't uh, feed people unless there's money to do it with and that sort of thing now over there uh, go ahead and, and speak to that same thing have you got anything to add to it uh, like uh, maybe the mines or anything if a person was injured or if they were too old to work or I don't I have never heard where they had any form of concentration for them. They heard when they recovered, if they couldn't work anymore, that was it. They were done, yeah. And maybe if they got killed, maybe the company gave them a couple hundred dollars to family, and that's all. Mm -hmm. It isn't like nowadays where they sue for thousands, you know. No, those days they just had to get along the best they knew how, yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah, and same with the older people. If they go older, if the, the other members in the family didn't take care of them, well, they did. That, they figured that was 
their duty to take care of their old people. Well, well that, uh, not only that, but they knew one day they would be old and their turn uh, would right. be That's right, and then uh, if they got uh, an incurable sickness or that, they, they didn't take them to hospitals or any place. They just had to live till they passed away. That, that's all there was to it. It was part yeah. of life. In yeah, those part days. of life, yeah. And that's mm -hmm. all uh, they expected, you know. Well, I'd like yeah. to. I'd like to uh, ask this too. Do you think that uh, people were contented uh, in those days, the way that they were living? Of course, they had nothing to compare no. to, I suppose. But you do. You have today's times to compare to, gentlemen. That's right. With yeah. Those times. How did the, how did the attitudes of the people, uh, seem to be in comparison to then and now? Is it? Do you notice any change at all? Well, I'd say back in the old days, they were a lot more contented than they are right now. Even with the modern way of living, and uh, you know the hogger too, you recall that they just worked and enjoyed themselves the best way they knew how. They didn't expect the government to come <laughs> along to <laughs> bail them out if they got in trouble or anything like that. Right, yeah. They just made it on their own, and there was no... I know my dad, he left uh, us when we were in 1913. We were just a bunch of youngsters. My mother, she had to make it. She raised us. Hmm. It was tough, but she, I You're think she's done here. a pretty good job. <laughs> still yeah, here, yeah. yeah. yeah fine, and man. there was no, uh, like I say, uh, relief or anything like that. Those days, you just had to make it, and that's it. And if you didn't have it, you had to go without. Well, I think that's, uh, I think, uh, Mr. Peterson, we're living kind of in a false assumption that the more we have, the happier we're going to be. But that carrot is always just out ahead, and I think that's the, the situation today so often. And as you, uh, as you compare the times, I uh, suppose you might have, have a comment that you'd like to make about uh, the situation. In oh, there's, there's a tremendous change. I... It's so big that it's hard to describe, but I mean, in those days, people were neighbors and they visited. They had time to visit and they had socials and people knew each other. Nowadays, uh, you don't hardly, uh, oh, maybe you see your neighbor going buying a car, or go by in the car or something like that, but uh, there's much visitation like it used to be. And people were invited out for Sunday dinners. It was, I thought it was real good. Well, I can't, I, I'll tell you the truth, fellas, I can't uh, blame the older people for talking about the good old days and those instances, and I'm sure, uh, I'm sure everybody would like to return to it, but yet it seems so elusive that it's uh, almost an impossibility to, to try to recreate that situation and atmosphere again. Yeah, well, uh, it I don't think you could do it in, uh, in this day and age, I mean, it's TV and cars and stuff like that people are on the go now they it isn't like in the old days they were home much of the time most of the time i would say but what i hear coming through from you fellas is this that uh, definitely did not require a great amount of money or material goods to be happy exactly and that's the point i'd like our boys and girls to get a hold of as they view the film that uh, you fellows are attesting to the fact that the more we have the busier we are using those things and the less enjoyment they really bring to us sometimes I think you're absolutely right Mr. Wilmer that's that's my contention and well I know I see no comparison I know grades this. as a teacher the uh, quality of work from students varies with um, social activities um, like for example uh, if there's something on television some program or if there's some event coming along why uh, we don't usually expect to have if we make homework assignments don't expect that homework to be done quite as well so uh, Perhaps in those days, I could be envious as a teacher when they had more time to spend on their studies, too. I'm sure that was the case. 
Do you do you have uh, do you have something that you wanted to share with us tonight that maybe I haven't drawn out or touched on? Something about uh, the history of your communities, either one of you fellows. Well, I'm a, I might just say at the start that uh, our area was surveyed in 1851, which isn't too oh. long ago, 125 yeah. or six years ago, and the first land was bought right where Foster City is located now was bought by Jesse Spaulding. Spaulding down at Powers is named after him. Oh. He, he acquired a large tract there in 1868, and that was a grant from the Congress. Wow. And uh, I think the mill started in the 1880s sometime. The railroad was come in in 1882. After the mill? No, I think... Uh, Prior to the mill. Oh, prior to the mill. But there was a lot of logging before the mill was in because then the they pine went down the river and it was floated down the sturgeon to the Menominee River and to the mills at Menominee, Michigan. Hmm. Millions of feet went down that sturgeon river. They had dams in those days and, they get to and, they held. and log drives. <laughs> yes. And they held too, yes. <laughs> We're making this film only the week after the new impoundment over at Hardwood. Uh, uh, broke and uh, threatened to flood out the homes in the area. Yes. Well, uh, as I understood from Ken Byers, uh, who worked in the woods in the Segola area, they would make uh, dams here and there so that they would have plenty of water to uh, send logs on. They had to have them. To and float them. To, before that, I, it always amazed me, how could you float a log down that river? I've, uh, you know... And that stream, and I, I knew they used to do it, and I used to scratch my head. And now I hope that uh, the viewers will will realize that there were these dams that the logs were ganged up in, and then then they would what send a few at a time or cut the. the well, dam they, 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 they 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 sent uh, they sent log. I mean, the river was just full of logs, and they were stamped in the end. Different uh, companies that owned different logs, they. Mm. had their own stamp, and they were sorted some way at Menominee. Wow. But they had these, they were all stamped in the end, and you can still find sometimes an old deadhead or something with right. a stamp right. showing right. yet yeah. of that company. Well, <coughs> if we ever found a submerged log then, or a deadhead, as you say, uh, and it's got a stamp on it, we would know what what the situation is. You would know the company if you could identify the stamp. Hmm. Well, very interesting. I suppose of all the changes that there have been and all the historical things that you have shared with us, that uh, I'll wish that I would have asked you some more things, but uh, you think for a moment and see if there's something that I haven't asked that uh, you, you I should have asked and didn't know that I should have. Now, Mr. Salberg... Is there something about Felch that you wish that the viewers knew, or maybe something that I didn't touch on that you might perhaps like well, to share yeah, with us? Well, not too much at Felch, but the metropolitan area. You know what they call metropolitan, yes, they're right. just a mile. Uh -huh. Now, there, when the sawmill ran there, there was quite a few houses there, and a lot of people lived there. And uh, they had the, the first town hall was at Metropolitan. And there always was a Catholic church there, besides the Lutheran church. Wow. And uh, 